We looked out, saw streets littered with wind, bodies raptured into homes on lockdown, four walls stared at me and began to whisper. I thought I was alone until I whispered back, they say that hope is a tease that lures you in with promises that don't always come true. I say that hope is often hidden from us. On the other side of darkness where dreams reside, it cannot be found in things that we might seek because we only know the real world when the shades have been lifted from our eyes. Because COVID, we did, before COVID, we did not see how black and brown bodies were being wasted, how sickness and economic deprivation were not new. Eyes would not see what was clearly in front of them until the mats came in plotting points that we all knew too well. That black and brown lives have barely mattered under the sun. They say that nothing is new under the sun, but on the other side of the post-COVID, post-protest skies, they say you can hear things that you rarely heard before, like the tanager singing in New York's Central Park, or the receding waves of pollution that flooded our skies. We see now the ways uh, we see now the ways that environmental injustice bumps up against racial injustice, sits alongside economic injustice. I can't sleep some nights because COVID's got me woke as fuck. I can no longer diet in daydreams, convincing myself that remote education is a real thing. It feels like an oxymoron to me. By definition, education can never be remote, as in stranded alone on a lonely island or pushed away like kids do peas or, so or society does black, brown, and indigenous folk. Put out like trash on Sunday evening, set aside on streets to be removed from sight while we forget that landfills are real. They call COVID novel, but this ain't new. Same old pains and same old struggles. Pandemics in black, brown, and indigenous communities are as diasporic as our kinship ties. The only thing novel about COVID is its name and the ways that it makes some folk finally feel and finally surrender to reality. But if they see us, they will see that we are more than just the disproportionate percentages of bodies occupying ICUs. We are also the collective commitment of humanity daring life to respond. We are the club quarantines and IG live DJ battles. We are Monica and Brandy on verses and the collective consciousness of Zoom chats and the counselors begging teachers to give students time to heal. We are the voices of those crying in the wilderness baptizing the moment in waters of our grandmother's tears. We are promise keepers, peace prophets, life givers, community healers, wisdom whispers. We are something that not even COVID can, he can kill because our lives are more than anguish and disease or the fixed routines that uplift human misery more than the death tickers that complicate our TV screens, more than the buildings and streets that longed for a pause long before we went on lockdown. Our lives are the quilt work of our ancestors stitched into air to make eternity. We join them in this moment. And in this moment to come, knowing that though we may be sitting alone, we are not lonely. So we raise our voices in unison, triumphantly saying, though weeping may endure for a night, joy comes on the other side of our morning. Good morning, everybody. I want to thank you all for inviting me to this conversation today. Particularly, thank you, Dr. Harrison, for your commitment to moving us over. I want to thank my colleagues from the NYU Metro Center, Maria and Reed, who will be joining you all today. I also want to thank each of you, because without you, there would be no event. Thank you for all that you do and will do. You're not only the change, you are the hope. Again, I'm David E. Kirkland, the Executive Director of the NYU Metro Center and Vice Dean for Equity, Belonging, and Community Action in the Steinart School of Culture, Education, and Human Development. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I do want to acknowledge that I'm standing on the Lenape land. I do this in recognition to the land, but also as a reminder that struggles for justice continue. We are all on occupied land. 
So we must all be willing to engage a project of remembrance while we also engage the revolutionary work of recovery, which is the opposite of cultural deletion and social erasure. So today I remember. With that said, I think it would be an understatement to say that we are living through life changing and challenging times. We're facing multiple pandemics. There is the health crisis precipitated by COVID. There's the social crisis reignited by the murders of Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and George Floyd, and the recent shooting of Jacob Blake. There's also the economic crisis, legislated by a series of poor decisions from our political leadership. But through it all, we are remaining diligent, finding ways to hold each other up and hold things together. As some of you may know, I've been blessed to partner with communities and schools like Irving, joining the fight to advance equity in education and beyond it. And though we fight to advance equity, which is a principle of fairness based on the recognition that all of our students are different and come to their education with different needs, we also fight to end the systemic racism and white supremacy that make advancing equity in our schools impossible. This is the brave conversation that we must have. That as our boots beat the ground to pay homage to the blood spilt from the violence of systemic racial oppression, I believe that we will best serve our children by standing in resistance to systems, ideological and otherwise, hewn from the bedrock of bigotry. So I ask this morning, what does it mean when your job is to enforce a law or curriculum when that law or curriculum is explicitly racist. If this is the case, and you do your job, and you do your job well, it means that you enforce, even reinforce racism. Today, I'm gonna to ask, how might we change our job descriptions? How might we, in a post-COVID education world, make education anti-racist, culturally responsive and sustaining, and radically reimagined for all of our students? How do we call for new institutions that instead of murdering our bodies and our souls, love us? How do we call for new institutions that truly uphold justice? Because as Cornel West said, justice is what love looks like in public. And let us not think what's happening in the streets across our country has nothing to do with us. Before Derek Chauvin dug his knee into George Floyd's neck, a teacher in the South Bronx, New York City, stood on the back of a young black boy so that he could know what slavery felt like. And though we might want to argue that in education, we have not fired one shot that claimed innocent life, we cannot deny the many ways in which we have helped load the guns of racial animus. We are in the midst of multiple pandemics. And I'm not just talking about COVID. I'm talking about the ways in which we take as normal the idea that structural knees bearing upon the necks of our children who find themselves at the bottom of every desirable statistical category that we collect and at the top of every least desirable one is not about us. The diseases here are the pandemics of amnesia and difference and apathy. We might find a cure in our questioning turning the lens of scrutiny on, on ourselves instead of others by asking, how do we center care in all that we do? How do we become more than just allies but co-conspirators in the revolutionary work of education? Answering these questions will raise other ones such as, what should we be doing now in education to improve it later? Because as hospitals exist to heal the sickness of our bodies, our schools, our classrooms in Irving must become the places that we go to, that our children go to, to heal the sicknesses of our souls. And our work moving forward, we have to center students more. Yes, the very young people who lean on us in spite of their circumstances, who look to us for care and safety. They look to our collective imaginations and powerful wills to invent a world that deserves them, because this is what I know. The best way to predict the future is to invent it. Also know that when we look at education, we must stare at a series of realities that should make each of us uncomfortable. That in, edu that in our nation, education is a tale of disparities. So I thank Dr. Harrison for inviting this conversation today, right here 
right now. Why? Because vulnerable children in our nation, in our cities, places like Irvington, are suffering. Inequity is a condition of their lives. Racism is real, and it intersects with other social realities, such as gender and language bias, housing instabilities and food insecurities, age and ability hierarchies, economic oppressions, even though we know what this moment has shown us, what we perhaps already knew, that our schools are not currently designed to favor the dispossessed and the maligned. That even before we, forced, we were forced to stare at the digital divide, finally understanding that the material possession of technology isn't evenly distributed across our country, before we acknowledge that some kids would struggle, economically less advantaged kids, black, brown, and indigenous kids, multilingual learner kids, kids with IEPs and 504 plans. In this moment of Black Lives Matter and COVID-19, we are being taught that a new world is indeed possible. It is true that various narratives of disparity shape how we understand education. This is why we march. This is why so many of us in education have joined countless others in the streets because of our poor, our black, our brown, our indigenous youth are disproportionately suspended, placed in a special education more, graduate at lower rates, perform less well on standardized tests, et cetera. You know the story. It's true that these disparities increase at intersections of linguistic difference, ability difference, gender difference, and at the apex of other vulnerabilities, as I've said. Today, I'm not going to talk about this because none of it is novel. None of it is new. Here's what's new, though. Our goals in response to COVID-19 and our current realities must be new and renewed. They must be shaped out of not what the disease has taken from, from us, but out of what it has given us. In the past few weeks, I've had the incredible opportunity to speak with school leaders and teachers and parents and students from around the country. Each of them has asked me for advice on how to move education forward. My advice has been simple, and it is the advice that I'd like to share with you this morning. To move forward, we must slow down. This is the question, not how to continue education as we know it, but what must we be doing in this incredibly crucial intermission as we plot our return in order to improve education? This is it. This is what we do. First, we listen. And there are many ways to listen. Psychologist, gender theorist, and friend, Naomi Wei speaks of what she calls the science of human connection, which is beginning to help us to understand the root systems plaguing our culture and our social communities. Naomi speaks of what she calls the crisis of connection, the idea that so many of us, so many of our ideas, our systems, our fundamental human practice is shaped by disconnection. This is what structural racism is. It speaks to how systems are disconnected from the very people they serve on the fundamental basis of race. This is what culturally irrelevant curriculum is. It is curriculum disconnected from the lives of some of our students. This disconnection shapes a far more powerful narrative of success and failure than anything else in education. But worse, it leads to consequences of structural and emotional violence that turns into structural forms of trauma and the kinds of threats that make education a hostile site for many of our children. So how do we connect? We listen thickly. And we listen thickly by doing equity audits and by using other instruments that allow us to hear from people so that we might get crucial information about them. Because how do you teach someone you don't know? We have to use this time to hold listening sessions, conduct empathy interviews with students, conduct focus group conversations with parents. We must get a sense of their experiences and their wisdom, because when we do, they tell us how to teach them. We listen by dreaming up the protocols and systems that give us time to hear, time to learn from those who are most implica implicated by the decisions that we make. I know that this isn't the Western way which is in so many ways concerned with the opposite of stopping and listening. 
But one of the most important lessons that we are learning with COVID is this, that we don't have all the answers. That life and death quite literally depend on our ability to chart new courses. So after we listen, we must dare to partner. In doing so, we must resist the impulse to make decisions alone. Let's instead enlist the support of those parents and those students with whom we listen. Because those who are closest to the problem are closest to the solution. The other important lesson that COVID has taught us is, is that we're in this together. Ubuntu, I am because we are. The decisions that I make affect you and the ones that you make affect me. This is the big picture. If we are to build brighter and bolder opportunities for our children on the other side of pandemics and protests, if we are to find shade amidst the intense heat of the moment, we must grab hands, put all of our questions on the table, and do as James Baldwin has so courageously and boldly told us to search deeply within answers for the questions they conceal. And once we get to the right questions together, we'll be closer to getting to the right answers together. Perhaps the biggest issue with the old system, should I say the current system, is that it was not designed for each of us, by all of us. The current system works well for those who design it. But it works horribly for those of us it was imposed upon. And because of this, we are hurting. So the third thing that we must do is collectively act. And the first part of collective action is understanding how to curate an experience that starts with an acknowledgement that something has happened and indeed has always been happening to our most vulnerable young people. The system is a historical and social artifact. It functions as its designers intended, shaped by the weaker impulses of those designers. It clings to the dark cosmetics of social hierarchy, tainted by sexism, racism, language oppression, economic oppression, and other social, economic, cultural, and political forces of violence, which are real. Each of these has had historical consequences that manifest regularly in our schools and magnify over time. They continue to this day. The acknowledgement of this, this truth telling that I'm talking about, means that the first step of our collective action must be, about, must be about locating the wounds so that we can focus on healing them. But not just the broken body of those of us who have suffered, but also healing the broken souls of our school systems. How can we turn the lens of trauma-informed care outward and onto our systems? How can we see where and when our systems are sick and hurting and hurting our children. To be sure, our children aren't broken, but too, too often our systems are. From an anti-racist perspective, the action required right now is about healing the global pandemic that afflicts our world with bias, infecting countless institutions with the disease of sight that make these institutions incapable of seeing certain bodies as valued or valuable or even human. Healing the system will take time. So when we go back to our physical classrooms, it must be okay if we don't go straight into the curriculum, at least not until week seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Let's move at the speed of trust. Because the time spent healing ourselves and our students, building relationships with them, interpersonal wealth will take us farther than just pressing forward while sick. There's an African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. As I've said before, we have to sit with the question, what does it mean to go together? I did a, um, a study of classrooms recently. One set of classrooms jumped into the curriculum on day one without purposing healing, without ensuring all students were equally ready to go. They privilege Bloom, you know Bloom's taxonomy, or questions of what we teach over questions of who we teach. Another set of classrooms took time to purpose healing, to focus on and center students and their well being, to collectively address the social and emotional aspects of learning before going into the um, curriculum. 
so that all students were ready to go. They privileged Maslow, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs or questions of who we teach before questions of what we teach. The classrooms that paused at the beginning ended up going farther than the ones that launched forward on day one. Not only did these classrooms, these classrooms that pause end up covering more curriculum, the students did better. Not only that, the students felt better. You see, this is about experience. Maslow before Bloom. This is about how we curate better experiences for our students. Because we don't teach English or science or social studies or math. We teach students English. We teach students science. We teach students social studies. We teach students math. And at, at the center of these constructions are students. And because of them and for them, we don't want to go back to normal. We want things to improve. And part of that improvement will mean envisioning a system or a set of environments that are welcoming and affirming, where the least desired or redundant components from the curriculum are omitted. It will mean dealing with the idea that school is a place of punishment for some of our students, and that this punitive narrative is usually based in some of our most dangerous and biased logics. How can we help all students, particularly our most vulnerable students, experience schooling as a site of joy? Because joy is one of the basics of learning. I'm an avid reader and a prolific writer. I read about 50 plus books a year and countless other things like research articles. I've published over 130 things, including five books, working on two books now that will be published in November. But before I was an avid reader or prolific writer, I had a chance to allow the loop of letters to dangle from my tongue. I had a chance to play with words, dance with them, hear them sing. The basics of education are things like pleasure, play, curiosity, creativity. And when children are hurting, it, it's their things like healing and restoration and care. And let's not shortchange joy because Foucault said that learning is erotic. Audre Lorde suggests that the erotic can be used as a source of power, both to motivate and to entice, to transmit, connect, and radically transform. However, too often schooling for so many of our children is constructed as a site of what Michael Dumas has called suffering. Again, how might we instead imagine schooling as a system? or set of environments that center joy, where one of the key outcomes in, of engagement, of interaction, of learning itself is pleasure. A joy-based reimagining of education will involve more human-to-human -human interaction, collaborative learning, less or no homework, very few assessments that are continuous in nature, and group assessments that feel less burdensome. A joy-based reimagining of schooling is one where we replicate spaces that center our students and let go of anything that continues to marginalize, exclude, and harm. Thank you all again for everything that you do and will do. You're not only the change, you're the hope. Thank you.